Next up is uh, my friend David Schultz. In the past 10 years, more than 200 convicted people have been exonerated of crimes they did not commit. Primarily, those exonerations have resulted from DNA evidence. Trial lawyer David Schultz, a commercial trial lawyer with Maslin Edelman, is also involved with the Innocence Project of Minnesota, a group that represents people wrongly convicted. Here to discuss the work of the Innocence Project, please welcome David Schultz. Somewhat unorthodox spelling of my last name, I might admit. Um, good morning, everyone. Two days ago, in Los Angeles, a district court judge declared innocent a 53-year-old man. His name is Cash, Cash with a K, Register. He spent, I kid you not, um, and apparently that was his given name. He spent 34 years in prison for a murder he did not commit. He was convicted largely on the testimony of a mistaken or fraudulent eyewitness. That testimony and its falsity was known to the police and they never turned it over. His exoneration was the work of the Innocence Project and that's what I'm here to talk about this morning. Now I admit it's a somewhat unorthodox topic or an unusual one for the trial network, but everyone in this room is part of our justice system and I personally believe that we have to care very, very deeply about this issue. In addition, this topic does, perhaps in a slightly different form, illuminate a theme that has been running through the trial network for 20 years, uh, and that is that it matters who the trial lawyer is. That trial lawyers, real trial lawyers, good trial lawyers, have identifiable skills. And we usually talk about that in terms of the art of persuasion. We talk about uh, cross-examination and opening statements, and all of that is critically important. Presentation matters, but before presentation is preparation, a dogged determination to understand the evidence, to know what the evidence is, and to find the evidence that matters to your client's case. And that theme runs throughout, I think, this whole issue of wrongful convictions. So let's talk about some of the numbers here. Over 300 exonerations by virtue of DNA evidence in over 70% of the cases, the convicted person uh, was a person of color. On average, they've served 13 years in prison, and all combined, they've served over 4,000 years in prison for crimes they didn't commit. Now, Maslin's got a, a case, a death penalty case, uh, in which we know that our client is innocent. And the real tragedy of that case is we may not be able to exonerate Tyrone Armstrong because we don't actually have any DNA evidence. It's, it's a myth of DNA in the public mind that there's always DNA evidence to test. In, in reality, in the vast majority of cases, there is no DNA evidence to test. That's the case that we have. Um, and we have uncovered incredible exonerating information that was never found by his trial lawyers, who, by the way, when I interviewed them to suss out the ineffective assistance of counsel claim against them, literally said, well, what do I need to do an investigation for? I know how to cross-examine witnesses at trial. And his cross-examination style, by the way, largely consisted of saying, of repeating the direct examination and then saying, really? <laughs> now, um, in total, there have been 12 hundred exonerations since 1989. It is, unlike so many issues in the law, this is an area that is truly black and white. You have someone who has been convicted of murder, and the fact is, they didn't do it. That is a, a misjustice, a miscarriage of justice of epic proportion. Something has truly gone very wrong in our system. So let me talk a little bit about what the Innocence Project is and then show you the work that they have done. Uh, it was founded in 1992, the original one by Barry Sheck, yes, of the O.J. Simpson trial fame and Peter Neufeld. There is now a national innocence network made up of about 70 different innocence projects, including the one here at Loyola Law School uh, that exonerated Mr. Register. 
Um, and the work that is done is primarily done by law students and journalism students. Through the work of the Innocence Project uh, all over the country, we've identified six basic contributing factors to wrongful convictions. Eyewitness misidentifications, forensic science gone bad, false confessions, snitch testimony, I hate to dignify it with informant testimony, government misconduct of one kind or another, prosecutorial, police, what have you. And then the sixth category, which I think really isn't so much a separate category because the other five really don't lead to a wrongful conviction unless number six usually exists or almost always exists, and that's bad, bad lawyering. Let's talk about these causes. I'll get through probably about four of them. Wrongful or mistaken eyewitness identification. It is the single most common contributing factor. 77% of DNA exonerations studied have been shown to involve an eyewitness misidentification. And I think that illuminates a, a theme that we heard about yesterday. Eyewitness testimony is incredibly powerful, particularly in the area of identification of a perpetrator. Because you literally have somebody saying, that guy, there, him, he did it. And the jury believes that. It's very powerful evidence. And yet it's notoriously unreliable, particularly we found out in the area of cross-racial identification. White victims are very poor at correctly identifying African-American perpetrators. African-American victims are very poor at identifying white perpetrators. It is a very big problem in eyewitness misidentification. But sometimes it's not a matter of a simple error. Sometimes it is, in fact, uh, misleading. It's the result of misleading conduct. This is a photograph uh, taken of a lineup that was conducted. Now, the victim in this case could not identify, couldn't provide the police much evidence about um, her uh, perpetrator, but she was able to say that it was a dark-skinned African-American male. Now, this picture doesn't really show it very well, but there are there is one African-American male in this picture, three Hispanic men, and a Caucasian man. When she was shown this lineup, this in-person lineup, who do you suppose she identified as the perpetrator? False confessions. False confessions is one of the most counterintuitive things that you can run across, and juries seldom believe it. People confess to crimes they didn't commit, and in fact, uh, it has been shown to be present in one form or another in about 25% of the exoneration cases. We typically think of it as maybe it's somebody who is mentally vulnerable or somebody who's young, and that certainly happens. But often it's people like you and me who are coerced in one form or another into confessing. Let me show you a couple of examples of this. The guy on the left is Jeffrey Deskovich. Jeffrey Deskovich is here shown in this picture giving a press conference upon his release from prison. He is 32 years old. When he was 16 years old, a, a female high school classmate of his was murdered and the police focused on Jeffrey because he happened to be late for school that day and he seemed abnormally overwrought by the death of his classmate. He visited her wake three times. Now, when Jeffrey's parents were finally allowed into the interrogation room, they found him curled up in a fetal position on the floor, sobbing, saying, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. He'd been interrogated for hours without access to his parents. The guy on the right is Eddie Joe Lloyd. Eddie Joe, um, there was a murder in his town. It was a very gruesome and very galvanizing murder, and like all good citizens, Eddie wanted to do his civic duty and help the police. Now, Eddie is uh, borderline mentally retarded, but he, met, he went to the police to help them solve the crime, which the police understandably found to be a little bit odd. So they convinced Eddie that the way he could help them solve this crime is that if he would give them a confession, they would publicize the confession and the real killer so upset that somebody was taking credit for his handiwork would come forward and confess. 
Well, Eddie didn't know the facts that only the uh, perpetrator of the crime would know, so the police helped him with those, and then uh, as a result of that, he gave a detailed confession. Uh, but of course, the real perpetrator did not come forward to claim his work product, and Eddie Joe spent many years in prison as a result. Jailhouse informants. Um, jailhouse informants um, are often involved in cases. This is a picture of Dennis Fritz. Dennis Fritz and Ron Williamson were the subject of the book The Innocent Man by John Grisham. They spent time in prison for the murder of Deborah Sue Carter in Ada, Oklahoma. A number of jailhouse snitches came forward to testify. Uh, one of them uh, had to take a break during the trial of uh, testimony that he was giving in Dennis's case so that he could, could go down the hall and give testimony in a different case because that inmate too had confessed to this same guy of a gruesome crime that he had committed. Um, a second um, jailhouse informant had given very important testimony to the police um, because he told them that Dennis Fritz had confessed to him and Dennis Fritz had provided some details that only the killer would know. Well, of course, that informant, Glenn Gore, uh, when DNA testing was finally done in Dennis Fritz's case, was shown to be the actual murderer. The case I just finished up for the Innocence Project in Minnesota, we had six jailhouse snitches who came forward. Our client was in, in jail awaiting trial in 2007 on a murder that supposedly happened in 1979. And apparently he decides in 2006 to confess to these six federal inmates who are serving time in the local jail before they get sentenced on their federal charges. The problem with the six snitches in that case is the testimony they gave was often internally inconsistent and conflicting with each other, including details of the crime scene that were inconsistent with the physical evidence from the crime scene. Jailhouse informants are often involved in wrongful convictions. Uh, at least 15% of cases have involved some form of this highly paid for testimony because jailhouse snitches get a lot of benefit to their sentence when they come forward and help the police. That brings me to the last cause I'm gonna talk about here and that's forensic uh, misconduct. Forensic errors have been shown, at least as you see in the first uh, 225 DNA exonerations, forensic errors of one form or another were involved in 50% of those cases. Now that error can occur either in the form of just bad science or mistaken science or outright fraud. So take the case of Fred Zane. Fred Zane was a medical examiner in the state of West Virginia and his expertise was in the area of uh, serology, which prior to DNA was probably the most um, impactful uh, scientific evidence because you could type the blood, you could discover enzymes, and you could literally develop properly testimony that would be, well, only 10% of the population have those characteristics, and this defendant happens to be one of them. It's very powerful evidence. Fred Zane testified in a number of cases, convicted a number of defendants based on blood serology. The only problem was he didn't do the tests. He simply lied about it. He made up test results, went to court and said, yep, uh, these are the characteristics of this. Uh, this defendant has them. It's a match, quote, it's a match, which wasn't even what the science allowed him to say. And the problem there, which gets us back to the theme that I said about trial lawyers, is that the trial lawyers of those convicted defendants never found out about it because they never asked to see Fred Zane's lab notes, his notebooks, or the printouts from the machines that were used to conduct the forensic analysis on the blood. Let me give you a, a slightly different example of this. In, um, I think it was Lake County, Illinois, uh, there was a murder of a little girl, 13-year-old Janine McCarragos. And one of the defendants, Alejandro, I, th I think it was uh, Hernandez, uh, was convicted largely on the testimony of a forensic shoe print expert because there had been some footprints that were found 
outside the bedroom window of Janine McCarragos. And this expert uh, looked at those footprints and was able to testify from the footprint evidence that the footprints were left by a man, five foot nine, approximately 145 pounds, oh, and, and Hispanic. <laughs> That's how science goes wrong. It's, you know, it, it is funny. If it weren't so tragic, it, it would be truly funny. So let me um, end with one other example of forensic science which uh, gone wrong, which leads back to um, my, my starting theme here. And that's the case of Josiah Sutton. Josiah Sutton was convicted of a rape. Uh, he served a number of years in prison for that rape. There was DNA evidence available, uh, including uh, semen that was obviously left by the perpetrator in the vehicle where the rape was committed. And um, the forensic DNA expert testified at the trial that it was, in fact, a match uh, and that's the thing about DNA evidence. If it's your DNA, it's your DNA. It's a match. Well, the problem was, this is kind of the old uh, visual display of how DNA evidence was uh, typically displayed uh, at the time that Josiah Sutton was convicted. If you see the strip immediately above the white bar, that is Josiah Sutton's DNA sample uh, visually displayed. The one immediately below the white bar is the perpetrator's DNA taken from the vehicle. You don't actually have to be a forensic scientist to look at those two strips and say, they're not a match. But Josiah Sutton's trial lawyer knew a couple of things about DNA. He knew that it was an exact science. He knew that it was reliable. And he believed the expert who said, this is Josiah Sutton's DNA. And he never looked at the strips. And that, in my view, is a fundamental error of a trial lawyer. And that does bring us back to our theme, which is good trial lawyers, whether it's a civil case or a criminal case, have to be doggedly determined to find out what the facts are to understand the evidence presented and to find the facts that prove that their client is innocent or is not liable. Thank you very much.